Hello and welcome. My name is Alana Gordon. I'm a reporter and producer at The World covering global health. This is a Facebook Live Q&A about the coronavirus pandemic, equity impacts, and global fragile communities. With me is Jocelyn Kelly, Director of Gender, Rights, and Resilience at Harvard's Humanitarian Initiative um, through Harvard's T.H. Tan School of Public Health. Jocelyn, thank you for joining us for this conversation. It's a pleasure. And um, you can post your questions for Jocelyn and me on Facebook at Forum HSPH and at PRI The World, or you can email them to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. This Q&A is jointly presented by the forum at the Harvard T.H. Tan School of Public Health and The World from PRX and WGBH. We are doing this on Zoom through Facebook. And now let's get started. Um, Jocelyn, here in the US, we typically hear about how the pandemic is impacting our country, but at the same time, there's 2 billion people around the world, many living in conflict affected areas, grappling with this crisis too, and also facing additional challenges. So to start off, I'm wondering if you can tell us about what the dynamics are, what's happening in these parts of the world and a snapshot of what life is like in these communities during the pandemic. Thanks, Alana. It's such a pleasure to be here. So as you know, every region in the world is now affected by this global pandemic. We have 20 million cases currently recorded and over 100,000 deaths around the world. And today I'd like to tell you about my work at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. And I'd like to do that by telling you the story of two heroes who have interlinked fates and missions to address COVID in their own way in a conflict setting in Eastern DRC. Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, but first, I wanted to start the conversation by saying something that I've been thinking a lot about recently, which is that this is actually possibly the first truly global experience that the world has undergone together. And really, in many ways, we are all in the same situation for the first time. Um, if you think about huge events from the past, whether they're even world wars or natural disasters, these were widespread, but actually didn't affect the entire globe at the same time. And, you know, my hope is that the recognition of this kind of uh, shared experience can lead us to understand that we're in what I kind of think of as a global empathy moment, where we realize the extent to which we are all connected by the experience of this pandemic. Um, but <laughs> just because this is a global moment and a moment we're all in together, it doesn't mean that we're all affected in the same way. So, um, you know, as with any crisis, we see that the same issue can have very different effects on different populations. Um, and particularly, you know, we have to recognize that globally, there are over 126 million people in need of humanitarian assistance across the world. And 126 million? 126 million. And almost half of the countries affected affected by COVID are also refugee hosting countries. So lest we be tempted to think about this as a problem that only happens somewhere else, you know, this is a problem. Any country that hosts refugees is also facing the kind of, you know, um, impacts of COVID across these really different kind of vulnerability typologies, right? Um, and as we know, COVID, like almost every other health problem, highlights and exacerbates and deepens these pre-existing inequalities. So, and you know, if you really think about that, worst of all is if we um, leave that dynamic unchecked, it can bring forward vulnerabilities and inequalities, not only deepening them, but allowing them to continue to exist for years or even generations. And of course, this is especially true in fragile states and states affected by conflict and crisis. Um, so one thing I often come back to is that when the pandemic first hit, none of us knew exactly what it was or how widespread it would become. I was in Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, which is a place I've worked for over a decade. And it's also a place that has been affected now by um, decades and decades of really um, kind of um, entrenched instability, a lot of armed group activity, um, and it's also a place that was affected by the Ebola um, crisis. So as we know, you know, it's a place with a lot of um, specific challenges, and in particular, the conflict there was a war that has been characterized by 
kind of unimaginably horrific human rights abuses against civilians, um, but particularly against women. And one of the things that I think is worth remembering and talking about today is the gendered impacts of COVID and particularly the gendered impacts when you layer that into a crisis environment. Um, so as I was in Eastern DRC, I was traveling around with this incredible human rights activist named Annie Mwanga, and she is head of um, a network of women human rights activists that I've uh, worked with for quite a while now. And the project that we were working on was to um, help this network of women's activists promote human rights and women's rights in um, small mining towns in Eastern DRC. So it's a place that has very uh, rich minerals, including gold and um, uh, many of the minerals that go into our electronics and laptops. So what's interesting about this is that these are mining towns are places that kind of draw people who often have nowhere else to go and no other job opportunities. Women have um, often come to these towns when they've lost their families, people that have been displaced by war go there, young men leaving armed groups who aren't able to find work elsewhere. Um, the conditions are crowded, there's no running water, poor access to sanitation and hygiene. And, you know, these are kind of, in many ways, some of the most dire and crowded conditions you can imagine. So in that way, they're often like refugee settings. Um, and we saw there what we see everywhere, which is that women are bearing the brunt of um, not only those challenging conditions, but of um, the COVID pandemic as it began to become um, more widespread in Eastern DRC. So we know that globally, 60 to 80% of caregiving is actually done by women. And when you think about um, the burden of that when trying to hold down a job, but then you have um, schools closing in Eastern DRC, just as they close everywhere, women are now caretaking for young children and elderly relatives. Um, and elderly relatives are often those most affected by the COVID pandemic. So, um, you know, in the mining towns, I was working with, with Annie, we wanted to do some quick startup research to really understand how the impact of COVID was affecting folks. And so we did some remote interviews um, safely and socially distanced. Um, and what we saw that was almost immediately women were bearing a bigger impact of the pandemic than men. And that for everybody across the board, wages were going down, people were working less, and people had less access to um, kind of basic needs and basic goods. Almost one in 10 people said that their communities had become more insecure in general and that there was increased armed group activity in these places. So it's really um, important to remember that COVID is now overlaid upon these really complex political dynamics and that armed groups sometimes use um, events like this to their advantage to kind of consolidate power or create more chaos. And then more than half of the people that we talked to said that um, food insecurity had drastically increased and one in 10 women had actually skipped a meal just in the past few days because there wasn't enough to eat within their families. Um, as you can imagine, food insecurity also really plays into your ability to fend off a disease and to get better if you do get sick. So, um, you know, we were just seeing these like multi-layered impacts from the pandemic overlaid in these complex towns. But what was really inspiring is that um, we had been working to create um, visual um, kind of comic book strips to help people better understand their rights and um, safe mining practices in these areas. And that's really particularly effective visual arts in a place where not everybody has had the chance to um, access education, right? Um, when I next wrote Annie about the results of our research, she sent me back these extraordinary, beautiful comic book images all about how to stay safe during COVID, how to fight the pandemic, um, how to seek help if you needed it. And she had done that with a local women's comic book artist. And so what was really remarkable is that you kind of see people just um, adapting and doing the best they can. And you have these local peace builders really stepping into these leadership kind of roles where they integrate um, the pandemic response into this incredible activist work that they're already doing. Um, at the same time that Annie was doing that, our second kind of hero or the tale of our second town um, in the district next door is a colleague of mine named Amani Mataboro. And he runs a school called Congo Peace School. 
And this is a place that he created to take in orphans and war affected youth um, during, you know, this decades long conflict. Um, and what was really interesting is he kind of pivoted even while the school was closed to draw on his network of alumni who had been trained in things like um, the sciences and trained as seamstresses. And so they created masks for all the kids and paid, you know, the alumni for their work. And then Amani went out and went to a local university, talked to a chemist who was mentoring some of his students, and they decided to bring chlorinated water by themselves in big tanks to all of the remote schools in the area because these kids don't have access to great um, running water at the best of times. And in the pandemic, it's even more important. So, um, and it kind of tied together because Imani was actually talking about the risk if he didn't reopen a school in a safe way that the kids he was working with would actually seek work in places like mining towns where they would mm -hmm. face sexual and economic abuse and risk of injury and of course risk of COVID as well. So, um, you know, one of the things I'm really taking away from the work and some of the work that we do uh, at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative is this understanding of how incredibly important peace builders are, as um, we think about who are going to be the leaders, who are the interlocutors, who are the trusted people in this moment who can bring an understanding of what's happening to their local communities. Um, you know, fragile communities and conflict and crisis affected communities often don't necessarily have a deep trust of their own government. And so these are the people um, who are doing the work every day, who, you know, walk three hours to get somewhere to do education, that are the kind of um, uh, ethical brokers of of what needs to happen and, and, and kind of the heroes of the story. And, you know, as we have begun to learn, um, here in the U.S. as well as elsewhere, one of the most important dimensions of infectious disease, interestingly enough, is behavior change. So it's not just about a virus, it's about how we as humans respond to that virus. Um, and so these are the folks who um, are trusted, who've done the work, who've done the legwork for decades, who are really going to um, create the change that we see as we move forward. Um, I want to um, just ask from that, those are some two really powerful and um, inspiring examples. Um, some of the themes you talked about with um, a especially large burden on women of the pandemic, um, as well as some of the ways that the pandemic is um, kind of accentuating some of the inequities that existed. Um, and in some of the stories that you're talking about in the DRC, to what extent does that reflect the challenges that exist in other communities around the globe, um, other examples you might have in um, whether it's refugee camps, um, if there are some deeper themes that you're seeing happening more broadly. Absolutely. So I think these kind of vignettes are really meant to show what we are seeing across, um, you know, across the board, particularly in fragile communities. And it's worth remembering a lot of these places are um, fragile, not because only because of conflict, but these might be places facing enormous and very quick climate change pressures. And so, um, you know, it's this sense of having these multiple layers of complexity in these cases. Um, you know, I think we see uh, very much the same dynamics in, in refugee settings, but it's also worth remembering here in the US and throughout the world that um, we're seeing increased pressures and risk factors for things like violence um, everywhere that the pandemic is hitting. So. I think you mentioned the impact on women and what we often hear is that actually domestic violence against women and children in the home is actually called kind of the shadow epidemic or the shadow pandemic. And one of the things that we have to remember is that there are often really hidden or invisible dynamics at play that if you're not looking for them, you wouldn't necessarily see them. Um, I was talking to some um, uh, women in Italy who work a lot with refugee and vulnerable populations and they were noting that um, uh, while calls to um, hotlines for domestic violence had plummeted during quarantine, the online help seeking had spiked because people can't speak out loud in their homes about what they're experiencing, but people are still trying to do help seeking in, you know, in, in whatever way that they can manage. So I think it's important to remember that, you know, this pandemic really 
increases the risk factors for um, violence in the home and for stressors, you know, throughout our lives. And that includes confinement and social isolation and increased levels of emotional and financial stress and weak institutional responses. And that's all of those things come into play when we think not only about fragile communities, but, you know, all communities. So um, you're kind of responding to some of the questions that have come in from online in this. Um, so I wanted to build on there, there has been a question from a viewer about domestic violence and whether trends have been similarly increasing as they have been reported in the United States. But on top of that, um, one of the questions is um, what sorts of resources exist to help people in these situations in areas that are experiencing this kind of conflict? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, huh. so um, I think there are some really remarkable um, responses from the global humanitarian community. I work with UNICEF and they've really quickly turned around um, guidance. They have a COVID-19 tip sheet for improving humanitarian assistance in, in this time. And so do many other, you know, wonderful international NGOs, you know, and it's, what's really interesting is watching people really learn as they go. They're not stopping to say like, well, we haven't done a five year study, so we're not gonna try to figure out how to adapt. Everyone is doing the best they can, updating the guidance as quickly as they can and trying to build in things like, um, you know, screening for domestic abuse if a humanitarian is going from household to household or tent to tent in refugee camp and trying to understand what food insecurity looks like in that home. They're also being, um, you know, supported to also look for signs of domestic abuse and things like that. We've also seen some really innovative solutions, you know, across the globe. I'm sure you guys have heard stories about, um, you know, in France, pharmacies, you can go into a pharmacy and there's a code word to report domestic abuse in a way so your partner doesn't know that you're doing that. And that's one of the few places that you're kind of able to go during quarantine. Um, in Italy, with the, um, with the, uh, women I was telling you about, one of them worked for this incredible um, countering domestic violence organization, and they just made these little clips online that just said, we see you. Please reach out whenever you feel safe. We know what you're going through. You're not alone. And so whatever way you can find to convey that message, whether it's through humanitarian programming and you're already going door to door to help do nutrition programming and you can build into that some safety screening or whether it's through these kind of other innovative pathways, we're seeing people really kind of stepping up and taking on this challenge. Um, again, this is a Facebook Live with Jocelyn Kelly from Harvard's Humanitarian Initiative, and you can um, submit your questions to us for the discussion. Um, this one is the question that actually made me think about when you were talking at the beginning of the de discussion about the ways that people and communities facing these challenges are trying to um, find workarounds and support each other. Um, but there is this kind of big looming question when it comes to things like access to vaccines and treatments. Um, and so one of the, there's two parts to this question. What might be the role in community health workers in getting these sorts of things to communities? But then also, um, how can it, we ensure um, that developing countries actually have access, equitable access to these vaccines and to treatments? Yeah, I think this is a core question. And um, we saw, you know, a really fast response to um, developing a vaccine when the Ebola outbreak happened in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and also Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, heartbreakingly there, some of the responses, you know, didn't draw on um, community building, you know, probably didn't have as much communication as they should have. And there was mistrust in the communities about why these interventions were being imposed, what outbreak um, management looked like, and why they were being kind of isolated from their loved ones. Um, the role of community health workers in this case is absolutely critical. Again, it's those kind of trust brokers, the folks that you would actually listen to who can explain to you what's going on. Um, but, you know, I have a wonderful friend who is an activist with a student network and they have a campaign called free the vaccine and her favorite um, expression is no one should be um, sick because they're poor or poor because they are sick and what we often see is in drug development only um, you know the richest people get access to drugs or certainly get at that access first and um, you know I think it's critical that we think about all the people who go into the drug trials to offer to help test this vaccine and to develop it, 
then have the opportunity to have first access to it. And this is really a moment where we can think about global justice and equity and understanding who's helped us advance the science and ensuring that those same communities are the ones that benefit from it. And just um, have those conversations been evolving into policies? I know that there's been some proposals, for example, with the WHO and like with um, some global vaccine initiatives. Um, I reported recently about a trial um, about the development of remdesivir and it's a therapeutic that from what I understand was developed quite a bit in um, areas affected by Ebola and there's questions about how this is being distributed. Yes, I think the truth is, you know, we as a global community in this, you know, potential global empathy moment really need to think about whether we're holding people and companies and governments to account to make sure that the communities who need it most and the communities who have kind of put their lives on the line to help us develop those vaccines get access to it, but also get access to it in a way um, that's understandable, that makes sense, that doesn't make them feel like they're having something imposed upon them that they don't fully understand. And so, you know, it's all of our jobs to make sure that that occurs. And, um, you know, we have seen some jockeying and some kind of national self-interest when we think about this. And you, this just doesn't seem like the time to prioritize those kinds of dynamics. So this um, question, I'm shifting a little bit, um, can you talk about how the pandemic specifically has hit refugee camps and what can be done to help people living in them? Um, and on top of that, you know, when you think about overcrowding um, or crowding, I mean, physical distancing, isolating, in practical terms, um, it seems like there are a lot of challenges. Are there any measures being taken to address that too? So two-parter. Yeah, it's a great question. And I mean, <laughs> So yes, you've put your finger kind of right on the problem, right? That refugee camps in so many ways are the, you know, nightmare scenario of where you would not want to see a pandemic develop. You have, you know, potentially poor access to hygiene. You have um, an enormous amount of crowding. Um, and, and there are cases in most of these places now. Is that correct? You no, know, absolutely. And I think that... Um, what we're seeing is that, you know, a lot of times we think of refugee camps as kind of um, very short term places where people transition from. But in fact, in some places, you know, the average time spent in a refugee camp is 17 years. And so when you think about the importance of improving conditions in these places, it's just as important as improving conditions in Boston or Paris, right? Because these are communities where people spend their lives and actually grow up. Um, I think there's remarkable work being done to to control outbreaks and you know one thing that can be said is that refugee camps have um, a humanitarian cluster system that is hyper aware of this challenge and trying to address it but um, in many ways I think we're learning as we go and um, there's been very heroic efforts by international non-governmental organizations like International Rescue Committee and by the United Nations to develop guidance and to adapt programming to address the issue and I think it's really dynamic. Um, these are two questions that I kind of want to scrunch together. I hope that's okay. Um, one is from Shane, and it's about how conflict impacts uh, the elements of the pandemic that are already challenging, like testing and contact tracing. Um, to what degree is, to what degree, and you touched on this a little bit, is it an issue of trust? And to what degree is it an issue of the logistical challenges that you're finding? Um, and then I have a follow-up question. Um, so yes, it, <laughs> that's a strong um, kind of, it's challenging in both ways. So um, what we see um, in many of these places is that healthcare infrastructure is deeply damaged, that, you know, um, NGOs step in to try to fill the void, but NGOs are dependent on funding cycles, and there's really not... Um, a replacement for having a consistent government that is there to support its people with, you know, national healthcare system, right? So in a lot of these contexts, you don't see that present. And um, service seeking is often really depressed because people are not, you know, don't necessarily trust the services they might get. There are very exploitative practices where people are then um, not told what the medical, the true medical fees will be. And so going into the hospital can turn into this kind of experience where you go into deep debt and not, don't know how to kind of emerge from that. And then, you know, things like contact tracing, it's been done 
to some extent in the Ebola pandemic. But again, as we were talking before, you know, COVID isn't just about um, the actual disease itself. It's really about social trust and an understanding of how to build these social relationships and an understanding of what you need to do to get tested, how to isolate when you have symptoms and um, how to behave if you think you might be at risk of COVID. What's really important there too is to tread this fine line between acknowledging this is an issue, trying to help people get better, raising awareness, but not also at the same time increasing stigma against people who might be exposed to COVID or who might have COVID. So something really heartbreaking we've seen in other contexts when there's an outbreak like Ebola is that people um, then begin to uh, get worried about the healthcare workers themselves, that they might be transmitting this disease and those healthcare workers can actually face some backlash. So it's really important to build in to this kind of trust experience, really great awareness raising while not also um, kind of letting stigma run kind of unchecked. And again, you know, speaking about the gendered impacts, there's a little bit of information that we're getting that sometimes female healthcare workers can face more stigma than male healthcare workers. So again, you see those kind of gender dynamics really coming up. Um, this question is from Trish. Um, well, so that got to another online question about how healthcare workers might face stigma um, and what can be done. It sounds like awareness, awareness is really big. Um, actually, before getting to this question, one thing I've been thinking about um, as it relates to trust is, you know, in the United States, there's a, a moment right now where lots of um, sectors are um, having discussions about um, health and about um, racial disparities, inequities, and also even racism within those structures. And I wonder how that then translates to the discussions um, and conversations and maybe even policies happening within the global commu humanitarian community and how might that dynamic play out when it comes to the communities where humanitarian initiatives are and how those dynamics play out. Yeah. Um, and thinking about trust and perception and yeah. Totally. I'm so glad you asked this. And, you know, as we were thinking about kind of pathways forward in some of these incredibly constricted and challenging environments, we've got the peace builders, the, you know, kind of incredible human rights activists. But um, one of the trends that we've talked about a lot in humanitarianism, and we probably talk about it a lot more than we're good at implementing it, is something we call localization. And so that's allowing local communities and um, local individuals who are the experts in their own problems to speak for themselves, to ask for what they need, and that we as an international community have um, have the responsibility to then respond with whatever technical expertise or funds that we can provide. But what we often see is that communities do a remarkable job of trying as best they can to build these resilience networks and communication networks. I mean, think about Annie reaching out to that, you know, women comic book artist and creating this incredible material that is like right on for mining talents. What you often see if you're not careful is that an international effort can come in and kind of just bulldoze right over that without even realizing all of those systems are in place and then try to put something in place that might not feel as natural or as appropriate for that context. And so this idea of localization means that we stop and listen and say, what is it that we can do to support the communities who are fighting this fight on the ground every day in their homes and in their communities? And I think, um, if we're careful and if we're really mindful about it, this can be an opportunity to leverage this moment in time um, to allow the localization kind of effort and agenda to absolutely blossom. And so, you know, what we've seen is that community-based organization and activists who didn't necessarily have a phone or laptop or didn't join Zoom calls with the big funders are now doing that, right? Because we're all trying to get better at connecting with each other digitally. Um, a huge, huge caveat to that is that we can't assume that that's going to happen. And so many people are being left behind as we move into a more digital world. Um, those people that are left behind are youth activists and women's organizations, people who don't have access to a cell phone. Many of the places I work have no cell reception, much less, much less internet. But if we acknowledge that and work really hard to begin to close those gaps, I think this could be an opportunity to see a flattening of a very hierarchical space. Hmm. I want to just, um, we're about out of time, um, and just give you a chance to kind of um, kind of offer some uh, 
that was sort of a conclusive thing, but just in terms of really um, kind of finishing off actually on this question that comes from Trish, um, we've talked about these themes, um, but how much or do you worry that things like domestic violence, especially against children, mental depression, what, how much do you worry and how much of this do you think we're missing right now? And I wonder if um, just in wrapping up, you could talk about some of those big picture themes of inequities that we're seeing right now um, and what you're seeing as kind of the most impending things to be addressed. Yeah, Trish, thank you so much for that question. And funnily enough, that actually speaks to a whole part of my work that I'd done um, before the pandemic hit, which is kind of how you can fall into cycles of vulnerability. So if you have conflict, conflict can increase these really invisible forms of violence and those forms of violence can actually persist in a very invisible way within the home. So the way I think about it is political violence can become personal violence. And that is kind of this long ripple effect of conflict that lasts throughout, you know, decades if you're not careful. And what I think is absolutely critical with the pandemic is to realize it's a similar stressor. And so the forms of violence or tension or stress that can affect communities and families may have a longer impact than the, than the pandemic itself. So even when the vaccine comes out, it's still our job to think about the social impacts, to think about the inequalities, and to not allow those to become entrenched and kind of replay themselves in these cycles um, that we're seeing. And it's also our job to like look for those hidden dynamics, to ask about it, to understand it, to ask youth activists and children and women to step forward and say, you know, how do you experience this, as well as, you know, some of the more traditional actors that we often talk to and understanding how they experience this as well. And are you seeing, I know we have to wrap up, are you seeing this, these discussions also play out in terms of, for example, in the US, when we talk about inequities, um, often um, black and brown communities are impacted disproportionately. Are those conversations happening when it comes, spans um, these global communities as well? Yeah, and I think we're, we're kind of learning as a world how vastly different can, people can be affected um, based on, you know, pre-existing health conditions, based on where they live, whether they have access to space, which is like an absolute luxury item, right? And so um, those are absolutely conversations that we're seeing. And, you know, in a lot of these places, you see there are ethnic minorities or folks who have really been kind of um, marginalized over decades or lifetimes and so those are the communities that always bear the impact of um, what can seem like um, a generalized problem and so I think we're learning from the US we're learning from um, an understanding of the inequities here but you know the truth is our um, you know our work in the US has a long way to go too and so I think we're kind of all in that together and it's our duty to think about the people that are often left behind or we um, are really poor at truly understanding, you know, the realities of, of some of these communities. Jocelyn, Kelly, um, thank you so much for your time. Um, I think that's a good place to end and wrap up our conversation. Thank you, Alana. It's such a pleasure. Um, so that concludes our discussion. Um, this Q&A has been jointly presented by the Forum at the Harvard T.H. Tan School of Public Health and the World from PRX and WGBH. You can view this full discussion on our Facebook pages and send feedback at forum HSPH and at PRI the world. Be safe, be well, thank you. <laughs>